In the name of Jesus. Amen. The texts for our consideration this morning are both the Old Testament reading from Jeremiah chapter 7, as well as the Gospel, Luke chapter 19. During Jeremiah's day, the temple of the Lord had become a den of robbers. The Lord says so. Why does he say this of not only Jerusalem, but the temple itself, which is in Jerusalem? Because they would not amend their ways for their deeds. They would not execute justice. They would oppress the sojourner and the widow and the fatherless. They would shed innocent blood. And they did worship false gods, even bringing them into the temple area itself, falling down to worship those idols with their backsides towards the door of the temple. How abominable. For they were creating a greater false god than any of those metal gods that they were worshipping. And that is a Yahweh, the God who had delivered them from Egypt, who would just wink at their misdeeds, their sins, their transgressions, their idolatry, as if they were nothing more than a, a bunch of impish schoolboys playing a little prank on their teacher. It's okay. I'll Look the other way as this goes on. This Yahweh that they created in their own minds did not require repentance. And certainly, he wouldn't follow through on this note of judgment, this finality, that in fact, the Babylonians would come and tear down the walls of Jerusalem and tear down the temple in Jerusalem. They believed instead, because God had delayed his judgment, that no judgment would ever come. Why? Because they were standing there in the midst of Yahweh's presence. They had the temple of the Lord. And it's almost as if they had this superstitious talisman that now they have the temple, no evil shall befall. They had turned the temple of the Lord then into a den of robbers, a place where iniquity flourished, where sin didn't have to be repented of. But the Lord sees and knows, and through Jeremiah proclaims, the end is come. Though his judgment is slow, his judgment will come. Why is the Lord so slow in bringing judgment, though? Because of his mercy. Yes, he is all-powerful, no doubt about that, but he is also merciful, and so his hand of judgment is delayed in coming upon Jerusalem so that they may hear and they may repent. They may turn from mute gods, from false idols, and turn to the God who speaks and who is and who will be. They would turn from death and sin to him and live. But they didn't. And so judgment came. It came because they wouldn't turn to him. And it's the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and exile that finally begins to bring some of the Israelites to their senses, brings them to repentance. But I want you to consider something this morning. When God brings judgment upon Jerusalem and tears down the temple, he doesn't delight in this. Instead, it pains him. 
Yahweh is paying to bring judgment upon Jerusalem, much as when you look at your child and know that you must bring some type of judgment upon them, some type of punishment upon them. It is painful. You don't want this. You want your child to love you, delight in you, always follow the rules of your household, but they don't. That corrupt, sinful nature brings forth the fruits of sin. And so when you bring judgment, when you bring punishment, when you discipline your child, it hurts. Maybe not hurts as much you as it does them, but it is painful. And so Yahweh is pain when he brings this judgment upon Jerusalem and the temple because the wicked would not turn from their way and live, which is what he wants. How painful do you think it must be for God in all of this? Well, that's where we see the gospel unfolding things for us this morning, don't we? Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem. God in the flesh is there. And it's Palm Sunday. And the crowds have been following him. And you, you remember all of this. The crowd singing, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then Luke notes that they sing, uh, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And the Pharisees, as well as the scribes and the, the chief men, the principal men, they hear this and they respond to it. But not by raising up their voices in songs of praise to their God who has come in the flesh. But instead, their ears are hardened to this message of proclamation. Their hearts are hardened to the message. They don't see Jesus they ignore his word. They do not listen to his voice. And they deafen themselves to the voices of Moses and David and the prophets of the Old Testament who proclaim his coming. They should have heard Psalm 118 as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and said, Finally, our Messiah is here. But instead, their response is not to lift up their, so, their voices in song with the crowd, but instead they say to Jesus, silence your disciples. They're making a ruckus. We're going to get in trouble with the Romans. And it is in response in part to this that Jesus is pain and Jesus weeps. Why does Jesus weep? He knows what's coming. Shouldn't he just be resolutely set in the path, stoically going about his business, unconcerned about Jerusalem and those who reject him? The answer is no. He who is true God and true man has true emotions. And it hurts. It hurts him to see that those who are about him do not hear his word and the things that make for peace. Not only his word, that which has been proclaimed about him, the prophecies about him, but that which he is about to do with his body being sacrificed upon the cross, his blood poured out for them, his death, which is to justify them, his life, which is to give life to them, his ascension, which ensures that they too, who trust in him, should asc ascend. He weeps because they do not know that this is God, Yahweh in the flesh, visiting them to take away their sin, their death, their sorrow. To give himself. He weeps because he knows the judgment which is to come because they reject him. The Romans will come with the might of their armies in 40 years. In 
40 years when the Israelites are again celebrating the Passover, they will be seed, under siege. They will be slaughtered, men, women, and children. Their walls shall be torn down. The temple shall not have one stone left upon another. For they have rejected their God in the flesh. Jesus' response to rejection is interesting. Do you remember uh, maybe when you were rejected by somebody you wanted to date in high school or college? That, that hurts, right? But it's primarily against yourself, and that's painful. Or perhaps the rejection is uh, a little different, like you were hanging out with this group of friends and everything seemed to be going well, and then all of a sudden, for one reason or another, they ghost you. It's as if you're no longer even there. They don't even talk to you in the hallway. You're not a non-entity. And then, there's anger at rejection, right? Jesus does not show sorrow for himself or anger at others. Instead, his sorrow is in response over what is to come for them. His sorrow is for them. This gives us insight into our own experience, by the way. Not necessarily the way we should think when we've been rejected for whatever reason, though that may be helpful. But there's something deeper here. When those around us reject God's word, we should sorrow. Not be angry. Not be sorry for ourselves. But sorrow in that moment. But also trust. Trust that God is going to continue to do His work through His Word. Yes, the end of these things, if there's continued rejection, is eternal judgment, not just temporal. But even as Jesus enters into Jerusalem and sorrows weeps over Jerusalem, there is hope. Hope for the Pharisees. Hope for the scribes and the principal men. Hope for all of Jerusalem. Jesus doesn't give up on them and say, well, that's it. Nobody listen to me. I'm going home. No. Notice what he does next. He goes into the temple. And there he preaches his law. He cleanses the temple, as you know from the other Gospels, that involves throwing out the money changers from the court of the Gentiles. And then there Jesus is, in the temple, daily teaching. When we think about that cleansing of the temple in the court of the Gentiles, we must do so in two ways. First, the immediate way, what happened there. And that is the Jew and Gentile now had space to be together with the sacrifices and the Word of God. And yet, no doubt, many continued on with the false assurance of the gods of mammon, money, reliance on sacrifice instead of the Word of God, and then finally, the false assurance of good works. Jesus' cleansing of the temple is to cleanse it from all of those things, along with bringing Jew and Gentile together, and do something far greater. And that is to take all of the mute gods, the false idols which are in our lives, who cannot bring our life, and cleanse us from them, as you heard in the hymn. This is a necessity, a greater cleansing, and that cleansing has happened to you in the waters of holy baptism. There, your false gods were washed away, but daily you now have to repent of these false gods, for they're mute. You can't get them to speak. You can't find any assurance or approval from these gods, no matter what you do. Think about it for a minute. When is the God of money, man, please? When you have enough. 
Mammon will speak to you. The God of money will speak to you when you have enough. And when you have enough, never. He will never speak. It is like this. You are there with your parent who shows no approval of you. Every child wants some approval from mom and dad. You know this. And yet mom and dad don't say anything. Instead, they say the opposite of what you want them to say. You've just done all of this work preparing maybe some guacamole for dinner, you know. And you say, Mom, try this. And Mom tries it and she says, Come ahead. You should try a little harder next time. This is the way the God of money, any of false gods, happen to be. They never show approval, and yet we're trying to seek their approval. We must return. We must turn from false gods, for they cannot say to the God who speaks. He is not a mute God. He is God who speaks unto us. And what does he say? Listen to him. Hang upon every word that he gives to you, for his words are truth and life. That's the second thing that happens after Jesus has cleansed the temple, right? So he goes in, cleanses the temple, and then there are people who listen to him. They hang on every word. Have you ever had that moment where you just wish the conversation would never end? Maybe it's some professor that you simply uh, delight in, and there he is teaching you every last thing that you ever wanted to know. Or maybe you're sitting there listening to a symphony, and you don't want the music to end. Or maybe you're sitting there with Grandma, and she's telling you all of the stories that you've longed to hear about her child, and you don't want that to end. You're hanging on every moment. That is our life in Christ. We hang on to every word, every moment with Him. For in this word He comes, He visits, He gives peace, He cleanses from sin, He saves. So it is, dear saints, that Christ's weeping over Jerusalem will be far different, far different in eternity. For there, he has no tears. Every tear is wiped away from your eyes. There, Jesus doesn't weep. There, Jesus rejoices. For you who have been hanging on his word will be there with him forever. The peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.